Bill Hurd from Hackaday. Today I want to finish talking about CMOS, and I appreciate you sticking with me while I talk about this kind of simple stuff. Why am I talking about this simple stuff? Well, it's foundation. It's like wax on, wax off for electronic design. It's how I learned it. Uh, one day when you go to pick a mic, when you've got the microcontroller you want to use and you look at what you can put with it, you start looking at voltage, you start looking at currents and thresholds, and you'll understand uh, what it takes to go with that. Or you might be in an FPGA design software, you select a pin and the output type, input type, there's everything we've been talking about listed right there. So this all goes together. So today I'm actually going to uh, show a, a, a CMOS layout package I found, open source. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, you probably don't have a, your own foundry to go have the chips made, but still kind of interesting. And uh, then we're going to actually uh, show, a, sh show the wafer under the microscope, that kind of thing. Um, but first, I want to finish talking about two types of the CMOS bus fam uh, CMOS families right where we left off last time. The first is a high voltage input, which allows us to put three volts, put five volts into three volts, for example. Remember, that's a problem. And uh, the other one is bus hold function, and that's a type of it's one of the CMOS families because of the high impedance of there, we can do things like make it so it doesn't float. Still issues, but we'll talk about that. So let's get started. If you remember last video uh, where I showed that this was bad, if you had a 5 volt part feeding a 3.3 volt part and the output could go over the supply voltage for this, for this part. Its input goes past 3.3, it's only being fed by 3.3 and it would make diodes uh, go into forward conduction. Well, there are families such as AHC slash AHCT that have this diode removed. And they're, they, you know, sometimes the H, they'll stick an H in there somewhere, meaning a high voltage, haven't seen it lately. Uh, but now you can go over the VCC by a certain amount. Here's another variation, and uh, it, it shows how, how useful some of the parts are. But again, you got to go back to data sheets to find these things or to use these things properly. Uh, but this is what's known as a bus hold family part, and it's pretty much denoted by the H right here. Um, though when you see an H, look it up. It might mean high speed. It might be uh, something else, right? But on the end here, sometimes it means hold, bus hold. And the way this works is here's the data coming into a transceiver, and it goes in and through this one. Meanwhile, it goes into a second inverter and is inverted and brought back out. So it's an output and an input at the same time. But this resistor limits the effect this has. It limits the current to, you know, perhaps a tenth of what this does. What's, what's the purpose of this? Well, in CMOS, if a bus floats, if nobody's driving the bus at the time, it'll start heading for that middle dangerous area I showed you, and then things oscillate, and then everything goes to poop. I mean, you, you can ruin your RAM, you can ruin all kinds of things. Never, ever let your bus oscillate, which starts by not letting your bus float. Well, what this does is it drives the last state. So if this was a 1, it goes to a 0, and comes back as a weak 1, and it tries to hold this in a weak 1. We can do this because CMOS is high impedance. This wouldn't work worth a poop on uh, TTLH things where the currents would be way too high. So um, picture that it's kind of like you ever get gum stuck in your shoe and, you, and when you go to lift your foot, there's that initial resistance, but then it lets go. That's kind of what this circuit does. Now, you might think this uh, it means you can get rid of uh, pull-up resistors on your bus, and you, you pretty much can, but you still have to figure out when you first power up the circuit, are they all ones, are they all zeros, are they a mix? So you still kind of have to consider how does what's the first initial state of your project when it turns on uh, before you decide whether you need pull-up resistors or not. Here's another variation on a part. Uh, Hans actually responded to the last uh, video on TTL about his like of the LVC family, which I agree, it's a nice usable family. And here they stuck a T right in the middle of the numbers, and that means it's a translating version of it. Remember, if the T's on the end of the C, it might be a TTL. We'll stick the T in the number, huh. and it's a translating. What that means in this part is you, you could power one half of it from one half to 5.5 volts, and then you can power the other half of it from 1.2 to 5.5 volts. So in this one part, you end up with a translation. Um, and this is, again, a CMOS family. They, you can do this easily in bipolar. Uh, I am not going to talk about all the various ways of doing level translations. There's just a ton of them, and um, I could do a whole video about them probably because uh, there's different, some are fast, some are slow, some are capacitive, some are expensive, some take a lot of board layout. Uh, but the, uh, but here's, a, here's a logic family where somebody moved a T, figured I'd show you. 
I'm running a little long on the video here, but I just I wanted to show you some of the physical aspects as well. And I was lucky enough to, like I said, to work around chip designers in the chip fab process, and it's very cool. This is a wafer from my time. Yes, I'm a grandpa. Uh, these days they're they're dinner plate size because if you're going to do that many steps, that many processes, you'd want as many as you could get. There's not a lot of chips on here. I've seen these where you count them like on a couple, you know, you, you count them up and there's 20, maybe five good ones, right? So, uh, but this is a, oh, probably a four inch wafer from the 1980s. And I've got a piece of it under my microscope here. I'm gonna show it to you. Unfortunately, the microscope is not set up for the kind of lighting from the top. When I go up in the uh, optic zoom, I, I can't get enough light in to show you. And, and that's why I was gonna show you an old one is that there, this is a one micron rule. Uh, it's big in other words, so I was hoping we could see some things. But I'll show you, then I'm gonna draw you uh, kind of what, what goes into uh, making some of these CMOS gates. This is my widest field of view uh, where you can actually even see the chip dies themselves. They're, they're kind of packed together on one of these wafers. The center of the chip's not very interesting. This is a ROM, so it's like a, just a field of a very repetitive gate. But off in the edges, we've got some drivers and some row, row address counters and things like that. And so we're going to try and zoom in and maybe you'll start to see the layers. You, you really can't see them here. You can see some writing on here. And the guys actually used to like to sign their chips, so uh, talk about an Easter egg. Here we are zoomed in uh, a little bit more and most of what you see is the metal layer and the metal layer is on top and obviously you can't see through it uh, but you do start to see if you look at the things for example in here uh, we've got some things that aren't metal running up and down and we start to see the dimples of contacts and that kind of thing and then some of the colors and I hope you can see this on YouTube maybe you can't um, we start to see some other things going on here that cause little differences in color uh, at this magnification. Well, unfortunately, it's not going to get much better than this, do, again, due to the lighting. Maybe I'll increase the contrast in post. Uh, but you do, you do see there, there's probably poly layers under here. We see the contacts, and these are transistors going on in here. Uh, you, trust me, <laughs> when I show you a cross-section, you know, what's going on is it's probably depletion. I'm sorry, diffusion uh, here on the ends. And uh, let me show you what make up a MOSFET on, on a uh, substrate. Here is uh, the substrate, which represents the wafer. In this case, it's a, it's a P-type substance substrate, and it's something that we can grow in MOS transistors on pretty directly. So we end up, and again, I'm not showing the order of this, but what they do at one point is we deposit a silicon dioxide insulator, and above that, we have poly, polysilicon. All right, and this will run off somewhere and, and join a contact, and the insulator is just, it, it's, it's just there in that one instance. And then we diffuse, and, and the word diffuse means they used to dope it like, like chemically, but now they use an ion implanter, and they diffuse two regions into the corners of these, I mean on, on the ends of these. And so this is really all there is to a, uh, an in-channel FET in this case, where we've got the gate connected right here, and we've got our drain and source, and we've got an insulator, and this gate inputs its electrical field on here and allows a conductive path to form in here. So this is our end channel. Now, before we can grow a P part, and they, you, you know, in, in the old days, you chose your substrate for either PMOS or CMOS. Well, now to do the P, P uh, MOS transistor, we actually have to sink a well of the material we want. This is called a tub. And there was a time when they were doing dual tubs. They would grow one for P and one for N, uh, but it's less steps to, to have one that sits native on, on the substrate and one that you grow the well for. So now same thing. We get our insulator on there, or metal oxides, our oxide. We make our gate. Now in this case again, it's poly. In the old days, uh, actually we went through a stage where we had poly gates and then we went to metal gates, uh, metal gate CMOS. But what happens is uh, as they need to uh, anneal these parts at high temperature and whatnot, the metal started shifting around on them because it melts. And now we're back to poly and now we're back to metal again because they've got a really good insulator in here that allows us to go to metal and that's where we get the 45 micron stuff these days. By the way, if this metal with an insulator looks like a capacitor, it is. 
and this is where CMOS, um, when you when you drive a CMOS part, you're driving capacitance, and there it is. There's a sandwich. Once again, then we grow, we implant our diffusion layer to make our drain and our source, and just like the other transistor, you apply the right voltage to this, and you will push down. You will enhance its ability to conduct current between these two diffusion zones, and you've got your P-channel device. Here's a top-down view of making an inverter that we showed earlier, P-channel high, uh, in-channel low, uh, laying it out, only now it's from a top view. So the I've tried to show the, the, the layers very, very simplified. This, I mean, there's so many steps in making this stuff. There's depletion and there's etching away and reverse photo mass and all that. But on the top is, on the top of all this is an insulator but it's called passivation. But underneath that is, is metal, shown in this blue. And the poly, which is the gate material, and it's also a conductor. It runs in a metal layer. And then diffusion, which is the, what makes up the, the, the drain and the source of the FET itself. So if we look at the signal coming in, here it is here. It comes in on the very top layer, and in, in, in what you don't see is how it got to here, whether it's bonded by a metal lead or something. But it starts out as metal and then bonds, all, it, it uses, we call these pre-ohmic contacts, the ones that go between the top and the middle. And then that poly runs and crosses across the green. And the green is the diffusion layer that's been pushed all the way down. Now to get the output from the drain and source of these, they come up through what used to be called a, a buried contact, probably still is buried contact, and I think the macro we, we ran, it did both, both contacts, so it came all the way to the top to the metal. So if we look at this, here's our input, here's a gate, here's a gate, this is the transistor when, where there is a drain and a source on either side. Now it's the dimensions of this, and they used to draw this like uh, 2 over 8, 4 over 8. Th these are in units that represent, uh, that can be scaled. So, that, you know, like 2 over 8, you know, I think they used to call it lambda. Um, this dimension, this is the gate length, even though it's actually usually wider than it is long because of, of the gate gain. And, and you actually see that here. Um, in, in this device, it's actually wider than it is in this. And this is the P-channel device. Matter of fact, here, here they've grown the P-well. This length is what we refer to when we talk about design rules, such as 45 nanometer, 85 nanometer, 1 micron, 0.6 micron. This is the length, and actually we tend to refer to it as the effective length, which is affected by other conditions such as the, the bias voltage, things like that, substrate bias. Um, but, but there it is. Here's, here's a transistor. Here's a, a whole inverter gate laid out. Got our, uh, our in-well for a P-channel device to sit down in it. And then here's our in-channel device. The program I'll be running today, uh, the open source program for doing CMOS layout, if you want to. Uh, but it is kind of cool to see the inside of this stuff. It's called Magic, and I got this from OpenCircuitDesign.com. And I'm just going to go ahead and open a, a cell that's uh, pre-made. I was working with it here a little bit. And here's our inverter. It's, it's slightly different than what you saw on the bench. But uh, by now, some of these parts might even be looking like old friends. This is the input, and this is a contact. And polysilicon, that is a conductor that also makes up the gate, is red. So right here is a device, uh, one transistor, and here is the other transistor. This is an in channel right here, and that's because the bright green is in diffusion. The brown is uh, P diffusion. I'm going to turn off the well. Remember, we, we had a well or a tub around the P device, and so now it's a little easier to see. So uh, to, to draw doing this, we just turn on our grid. And if I wanted to extend the metal, this, this is weird. You, you left click on one corner and then right click on the other, and then if you want to extend it as a type of metal, uh, we go and we find our metal, and we middle click. And so now I could, if I wanted to, I could extend this metal layer over to the next cell. Well, that does it for me for this time. This is, uh, I've run too long as it is. Hopefully you stuck with me through all this. There was, I think, some cool things about CMOS, but I tried to cover everything about CMOS so we can keep moving forward. So join me next time. I believe I'm going to talk about differential signals and also termination techniques. And that should kind of do us for the stuff outside of a chip. We can start moving inside a chip. So from Gates to PGAs, Bill Hurd for Hackaday. Join me again next time.